I'm Belinda Needham. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Epidemiology. Um, my background is in sociology and demography, um, so that's my training. And then I did a postdoc in population health. Um, and then for a while I was a professor in sociology and then decided to move over to public health. I've done some work that focuses on children, other work on adolescents, other work on middle-aged and older adults to try to get sort of a full sense of how do social conditions, particularly social conditions that you experience in childhood or early life, how those things influence health outcomes later. So when you're studying children or adolescents who don't really have those age-related diseases that are ultimately the most interesting to someone like me, um, then you have to get a little creative and think about what are some things that might predispose these people toward developing health problems later in life. And so I got really interested in um, mental health conditions because there are disparities already evident in adolescents and young adulthood for mental health disorders um, and I was particularly interested in depression and how experiencing depression early in life might put you at risk for um, physical health problems later in life. And so I was focusing on mechanisms like reduced educational attainment um, so adolescents who experience depression are less likely to go on to college, which might um, increase their risk of poor health later in life. And so this idea that when you're exposed to chronic stress, which oftentimes depression is a result of exposure to chronic stress, um, then it causes this wear and tear on biological systems that will ultimately have negative implications for physical health. The most exciting thing I think I've been doing lately is trying to um, observe and quantify disparities at birth using a biomarker of cell aging to assess how prenatal conditions, particularly maternal social status, is associated with newborn telomere length. Um, and whether you can already see that some babies are born with greater health risk than others. If you're interested in reducing socioeconomic disparities, for example, then you want to focus on policies that reduce socioeconomic inequality. So you might have policies like increases in the minimum wage or progressive tax policies that are designed to decrease income inequality. I do think that in the last five to ten years, there has been a growing recognition that these social factors really do influence um, health at the population level. I think it started with foundations recognizing that, and now increasingly you see that government agencies recognize this. You can't just address the intervening mechanisms. You can't only focus on behaviors and behavioral change to improve population health that you also have to address the root causes of inequality. My postdoc was through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. You know, they started this program, the Health and Society Scholars Program, um, I guess about 15 years ago, to address the social determinants of health, broadly defined. And so they were sort of, I think, one of the leaders in thinking about how housing policy and economic policy and transportation policy could all influence health, that all policy was really health policy. Um, and I think that that ushered in a, a new way of thinking about health and health disparities that's been really valuable.